Renault's fourth generation Megan family hatchback is now a smarter proposition in more ways than one. If you're shopping for something Focus or Astra shaped in this segment, it'll probably no longer be one of the first cars you'll immediately think of, but this updated Mark IV model is clever, sensible and very good looking, especially in this Sport Tour estate guys. The Megane is better equipped for the money than most of its rivals and there's now the option of a clever E-Tech plug-in hybrid powertrain if you want it. In short, this model line has a lot of life left in it yet. Ordinary family cars can no longer be, well, ordinary. People want polish these days, a smarter feel and high-tech features that make them feel pampered and premium, which means that in the focus-sized family hatchback segment, they may well find themselves looking at models like this one, Renault's rejuvenated fourth-generation Megane. This Mark IV model was first introduced back in 2016, but in late 2020, Renault treated it to a significant facelift, creating the car that we're going to look at here. With the French maker's position as one of Europe's biggest car makers severely under threat and a slim down range of conventional models forced on dealers by this brand's commitment to electric power, it's really hard to overstate this car's importance if you happen to run a showroom with the yellow-backed silver diamond above the door. The first Megane actually predates the Ford Focus, announced back in 1995, and shortly afterwards siring the successful Scenic MPV, since then, over 7 million cars over four different generations have been sold worldwide and the Megan range has broadened to include a family of models, including this Sport Tourer Estate variant and the RS High Performance versions that have long been regarded as benchmark hot hatchbacks. It's been some time though since this car has been a strong seller here, perhaps with good reason. The second generation version of 2002 was angular and interesting, but its underpinnings carried forward into a third generation variant which sold between 2009 and 2016 were allowed to hang on far too long. This fourth generation car represented something of a fresh start with a brand new CMF platform, striking looks and a much classier cabin. It hasn't made much sales headway though in a family hatch market that's committed either to class favourites or a switch into family SUVs like Renault's own Kajar. So the brand has subjected this Megane to a widespread package of changes in order to return it to the radars of possible customers. There's a smarter look, more sophisticated screen tech in a revamped interior. Uh, there's some new autonomous driving technology and the option of the plug-in hybrid e-tech power plant that we're trying here. All of this is crucial because in the Golf and Focus family hatchback segment, this runner has to take on and try to beat some of the very best cars that money can buy. Can it? Let's find out. There have always been two distinct kinds of Renault Megane uh, in the guises tuned by Renault Sport engineers and Dieppe. It's long been an enthusiast's plaything, ultimately responsive, satisfyingly fearsome and extremely quick. Uh, over the years, we'd always hoped that some of that magic would rub off onto the more mundane variants that most customers actually bought, but it never did. Uh, so these mainstream versions remained instead very different from the shopping rocket Megane models, uh, really rather French with their softly sprung, slightly vague steering demeanor. Back in 2016, when we first tried this fourth generation design, we wondered whether this recipe might change a little. It did, after all, uh, sit on a completely new CMF platform, which was usefully lighter and stiffer than before. Plus, Renault had also added in a selectable multi-sense driving mode system. Essentially though, this car's intrinsic demeanor remained little different. The brand once again returned to its default position of supplying mainstream Megane variants with light steering, fairly soft suspension and easily accessible but undemanding drive dynamics. In many ways, uh, there's very little wrong with that approach. Indeed, you could almost argue that it's what the majority of customers in the family hatchback segment actually want. Uh, the people who will probably really appreciate this car's supple ride, its decent traction and its balanced standards of body roll. It's no surprise then to find more of the same served up by this lightly facelifted model, 
although the brand has taken the opportunity to tweak the power steering system, uh, giving it a slight weight reduction and adding in more powerful and responsive onboard electronics. Uh, those are supposed to make the driver inputs more precise. The only way you can really feel the difference that this makes is by playing with the various modes of that multi-sense driving mode setup and that's accessed by a provided button ahead of the handbrake switch. Now you can choose from neutral, comfort and sport modes, uh, plus there's also an eco option and a perso setting which allows you to tailor your own specific setup. All these settings alter steering feel, throttle response, uh, stability control settings and automatic gear change timings to suit the way that you want to drive. With this facelifted model, the Comfort mode now has a lighter steering feel, while in Sport the steering gets 25% firmer and the engine mapping offers up to 25% more torque for what's supposed to be a more dynamic drive. In truth, there isn't really much about mainstream Megans that deliver that, uh, particularly now that Renault's banished the more powerful engines from the range, only the 300 horsepower 1.8 litre petrol unit used in the separate Megan RS hot hatch remains. Otherwise, the conventional part of the engine lineup is now based entirely on just two power plants, uh, both of them four cylinder units. There's either the 1.3 litre petrol TCE 140 powertrain with 140 horsepower and 240 newton metres of pulling power. That makes 62 in 9.4 seconds en route to 127 miles an hour. Or there's a 1.5 litre blue DCI diesel with 115 horsepower and 260 newton metres of pulling power that makes 62 in 11.1 .1 seconds on the way to 118 miles an hour. All these stats relate to the six-speed manual models. Uh, both engines, though, can be had with a seven-speed dual-clutch automatic gearbox. That's not quite it, though, because Renault also now offers this car with the rather interesting E-Tech plug-in hybrid 160 HP petrol power plant we're trying here. This is a 1.6 litre petrol engine mated to two electric motors powered by a 9.8 kilowatt hour 400 volt battery. Uh, this package generates 394 newton meters of torque and allows for a range of about 30 miles, plus the ability to travel at up to 84 miles now on electric power alone. It's quite an intriguing package. It's shared with the brand's Capture Small SUV. And as with that car, you always pull away silently using all electric power. And beyond that, you control everything with a revised multi-sense driving mode system that features three basic settings. The two extremes are pure, which engages all electric drive and can be locked in with a fascia EV button and sport, which is engine only and which you'll have to engage to replicate the claimed performance figures, uh, 62 in 9.8 seconds on the way to 111 miles an hour. Most of the time though, your choice will be MySense, which is a hybrid setting engineered to use both power sources most efficiently. Uh, this plug-in hybrid Megane's gearbox is an auto of course, but of the more unusual dog box clutchless variety, and it offers an extra B mode which maximizes regenerative braking to the point where you'll hardly ever have to use the actual brake pedal. Whatever your chosen transmission setting, nearly all the time when you're either off throttle or slowing the car down, restorative energy is being fed back into the battery. Much of it is then used to aid acceleration, but if you want to save all of it for battery-only town travel when you'll most need it, then a further e-save setting is available to allow for that. Inevitably, all of this clever tech carries quite a weight penalty, nearly 400 kilos, which has an effect on both ride quality and cornering body control. But unless you go throwing the car about, you'll probably be quite happy at the dynamic balance that Renault has achieved here. If you do want a Megane that you can go throwing about, then we would refer you back to that RS 1.8 litre petrol turbo model we mentioned earlier. This too has been lightly revised and is offered in two guises. There's the RS 300 model with the brand standard sport chassis or the top trophy variant which features the firmer, more track orientated cup chassis. Uh, both versions now have to be had with EDC paddle shift automatic transmission and both feature a four control four wheel steering system which helps with corner turning and aims to ensure stability at high speeds and agility at lower ones. 
Higher speeds will probably be the order of the day for most RS owners and they're readily achievable. This car's 1.8 litre power plant is the world's most powerful. 62 miles an hour from rest takes 5.7 seconds en route to a maximum rated at either 158 miles an hour for the RS300 or 163 for the trophy version. None of which, as we said at the beginning, has very much to do with the kind of McGann that most customers actually choose, a car rather more like the one we're trying here. In truth, there's not that much to set the conventional petrol and diesel variants apart from rivals in the class, but this E-Tech plug-in version is a genuinely interesting option in this segment. It offers the kind of PHEV technology that Ford Focus and Vauxhall Astra customers can only dream about, and it delivers it for significantly less than it would cost beneath the bonnet of a Volkswagen Group branded plug-in model. In short, in this variant, we have a mainstream Megane that's finally able to stand out for solid recommendation. It's well worth a look. Although this fourth generation began has been on sale since 2016, it's entirely possible that you may not be especially familiar with it, given its relative scarcity on British roads, in which case you'll come fresh to this Mark IV model's rather eye-catching looks with its clever use of lighting effects, uh, complemented on hatch variants and this Sport Tourer Estate model by a low-slung stance and a wide track. Stylist Lauren van den Acker hasn't changed much with this facelifted model, which is fine by us. Uh, this nose section is in many ways a real piece of street theatre, particularly when it's lit up at night with a riot of LED detailing that one writer reckoned reminded him of a fairground version of Salvador Dali's moustache. If you happen to be familiar with the original version of this uh, fourth generation design, then you will notice a few detailed changes on close inspection. Uh, the restyled bumper incorporates these smarter corner cutouts, and there's a revised lower grille which is chrome trimmed on the base iconic models, but is sportier looking on this plusher RS line variant, thanks to this F1 style full width lower front blade. As for the lights, well, indicators have been incorporated into the distinct C-shaped front daytime running lights, and all models now get the brand's full LED pure vision headlights, uh, the beam range of which has been increased by 30%. And from the side, well, from here you'll notice the low set stance and perhaps the care with which the Sport Tourer estate body shape has been fashioned from the silhouette of the standard hatch. This sporty station wagon is a significant 247 millimeters longer. As for the update changes, well, you don't normally expect to find any profile changes with a facelifted model, but a few do feature here. Uh, there's a smarter wing design paired with door handle lighting to provide more of a premium feel. And inevitably, there are fresh wheel designs. Uh, they both feature smart diamond turned finishing with 16-inch impulse alloys fitted at base iconic level. And these larger 17-inch rims adorning the RS line derivatives. As before, nice touches include these deeply sculpted door panels and this side vent in the front wing with its tiny swage lines that rush rearwards. At the rear, the tail lamps are now of the LED variety, stretching across the boot lid and incorporating trendy scrolling dynamic rear indicators. As before, there's 3D edge light technology, which makes the illuminating signature of these lamps appear as deep red slender brush strokes. Of course, as usual, what's more important is what lies beneath all this. Unlike the pre-2016 era Mark III predecessor, this Mark IV model McGann isn't just a restyled piece of bodywork sitting on fairly ancient underpinnings. Instead, this fourth generation design features the same light, stiff and really quite sophisticated CMF common module family vehicle architecture, which is used by the brand's Kajar crossover model. So the changes to the outside are subtle, as are the updates to this improved hands-free key card, which unlocks the vehicle on approach and automatically locks it when the driver leaves the vehicle with no need to touch the door handle. Time to take a seat behind the wheel. A very comfortable seat, as it turns out. Renault fits these chairs to the luxury segment Espace and Talisman models it offers in Europe, so it's no surprise that the dual-density foam design makes them feel extremely comfortable by the usual modest standards of a model like this one. So get comfortable, have a look around. What will you notice? 
Well, a few changes as it happens in the perhaps unlikely event that you happen to have tried an earlier version of this fourth generation Megane. Uh, the various screens can be bigger. Uh, there's a more premium feel thanks to upgraded trim and upholstery. Uh, you now get little extra touches like eight color ambient lighting and a rimless electrochrome rear view mirror. And perhaps most significantly, Renault has listened to commentators like us and has separated out the ventilation controls from the central touchscreen. Ah oh yes, screens. Well, we'll start with the driver information display you view through this leather stitched three spoke steering wheel. Even the base iconic model now gets this in seven inch form to replace the analog dials. And that's a screen size that grows to 10.2 inches with this RS line trim and is fully customizable with the ability to display a full 3D map right in front of the driver. Across the range, the instrument display changes in shade and design uh, depending on your selection from the various multi-sense drive system settings. Most of the time, you'll probably find yourself in the blue tinged comfort or sport settings, the latter delivering a prominent rev counter into your line of sight. A bit annoyingly though, none of the modes allow you to see a speedo dial and a rev counter at the same time. This central portrait style easy link display has grown in size too, although again only if you stump up for RS line spec, a base trim still gets a 7 inch monitor presented in conventional landscape format. The biggest display you can have in a Megane though has grown from 8.7 inches to this 9.3 inch screen which remains in portrait form and brings a touch of Tesla to this humble family hatch. It gains revised graphics and a glossier screen finish, but otherwise it delivers pretty much what was on offer before. It allows you to poke and pinch and swipe your way through menus for things like navigation, uh, phone functions, apps and multimedia options, and a DAB audio system that offers superb sound quality when it's ordered with the optional Bose 3D sound. Navigation is now standard across the range and it comes with TomTom Tom Live services for things like European mapping and speed camera locations. Plus you get expected features too, like voice control, Bluetooth and Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone integration. What else? Uh, well, frontward visibility is fine, aided by slim A-pillars, uh, but rearward view is slightly compromised, so you'll be making good use of the rear sensors and on this RS line variant, the rear view camera. Across the range, nice touches include the fact that, unlike a lot of other cars in this class, front seat lumbar support comes as standard. And you'll like the way that this lovely door trim mounted lighting strip changes when you change the cabin ambient lighting. Other than that though, with base iconic spec variants, you might find this car's cabin a touch short of surprise and delight features of that sort. Plus your RS line models like this one feel much nicer, not only because the screens are bigger, but also because you get red themed RS line trim, not only for the grippier sport seats, but also for the dashboard, doors, uh, the gear stick and the steering wheel. At this level, there's also carbon effect trim and sports pedals. As for practicalities, well, our test has had mixed feelings here. As with so many French cars, the glove box is halved in size by an awkwardly shaped fuse box. Uh, there's no overhead sunglasses compartment either. You do get a useful bank of connectivity ports, a 12 volt, an aux in and twin USB sockets in front of the gear stick. But unlike these two cup holders there, they can't be shut away with a cover. So you'll have to leave your smartphone charging in front of prying eyes. An easy way of solving that issue would have been to put some plug-in points inside this deep box between the seats, which is topped off by a neat sliding armrest. Uh, but close inspection reveals there that nothing's been provided for that purpose. Uh, on the plus side, the door pockets, they are of a reasonable size, and there is a neat coin tray uh, by the handbrake switch there. Plus, you get a useful concealed compartment down by the driver's knee. Time to take a seat in the back. Now the extended roof line uh, makes it easier to get in than you might expect given the swept back styling. And inside, well, we had quite high expectations here given this fourth generation model's relatively lengthy wheelbase and the fact that it's one of the widest cars in the class. In the event though, accommodation here is quite tight and that's despite Renault's insistence that there's more shoulder room here than most rivals can offer. That may be so, but unless the passengers ahead of you are quite short, you won't find very much space for your knees and legs. At least the central transmission tunnel isn't too prominent. Uh, the seat's quite supportive and there are useful dual cup holders built into this central armrest. There are reading lights and coat hooks in the grab handles and twin USB points and a 12 volt socket feature under these vents. 
Finally, let's take a look in the boot. Uh, lift the tailgate and you'll find that the opening is a good square shape, but the high sill will make it a bit awkward to get heavier items in. Inside the space you get varies quite a bit, not only with body shape, but also with the uh, power plant that you've chosen to fit up front. With a conventional TCE 140 petrol engine, the standard hatch offers 473 litres. It's 563 litres with the Sport Tour Estate. With the DCI 115 diesel fitted, the standard hatch offers 394 litres or 504 with the Estate. With this uh, E-Tech plug-in hybrid powertrain installed, cargo space falls significantly by 116 litres over the TCE petrol, which means that in this E-Tech Sport Tour Estate, we have 447 litres to play with. You get uh, two bag hooks, four tie-down points and a light on the left. There's no space for anything much under the floor, although in a conventionally engine model, you would get more room than this, particularly if you were unwise enough not to pay the extra that Renault wants for the emergency space over spare wheel. With this E-Tech plug-in variant, there's only really space for the charging cables and for the tyre repair kit. Folding the 60-40 split rear bench in this Sport Tourer model that is done with these useful side cargo wall catches. It reveals a substantially larger load area of course, although it is a bit of a pity that the seats don't fold completely flat. With a conventional TCE 140 petrol engine, the total capacity is 1,367 litres. It's 1,543 litres with the Sport Tourer Estate. With the DCI 115 diesel fitted, the standard hatch offers a total capacity of 1,288 litres or 1,484 with the Estate. Uh, this E-Tech plug-in Sport Tourer offers 1,408 litres of total capacity. For reference, that's a significant 290 litres more than you get if you ordered this PHEV drivetrain with Renault's slightly pricier Capture small SUV. Uh, with any petrol-powered Megane Sport Tourer equipped to base iconic spec trim, including the E-Tech variant, you'll get a fold-flat front passenger seat, which, when it's pushed forward, will give you the longest load area in the segment, around 2.8 metres. The more heavily bolstered sport seats that you get with RS line trim uh, don't allow for that feature. McGann buyers get a choice of either the conventional five-door hatchback or this Sport Tourer estate model. There are no coupe or CC cabriolet variants as there have been with previous generation Megans. And in our market, we don't uh, get the grand coupe saloon body style, which Renault does offer to most of the rest of Europe. Uh, from the launch of this updated model and at the time of this test, which was in spring 2021, prices for the conventional models sat in the 21,500 to 28,500 pound bracket with a £1,500 premium for this Sport Tour Estate over the hatch. With this facelifted lineup, the range has been much simplified. Just two trim levels, Iconic, or as here, Plusher RS line, and just two mainstream engines, both of which go against the grain of the current zeitgeist. Uh, there's a four-cylinder petrol power plant in a market where most rivals kick things off more efficiently with three cylinders. Uh, this one is Renault's usual 140 horsepower TCE unit and a diesel, a power source that some competitors are beginning to abandon. This one being Renault's usual four-cylinder 1.5-litre DCI 115 engine. Either way, for an extra £1,600, there's the option of a seven-speed dual-clutch auto gearbox if you don't want the standard manual. That's covered off the conventional models. Here, though, we've got a variant that's more unconventional, the E-Tech Plug-in Hybrid 160, a petrol-electric PHEV priced from around £30,000. comes with both body styles and both trim levels, and as usual with fully electrified models, it's an auto. You've got to really want the PHEV tech, though. Think in terms of a £4,500 premium over the equivalent conventional diesel auto or a £6,500 premium over the equivalent petrol auto variant. 
at the opposite extreme, but in much the same price bracket is the Wild McGann RS hot hatch, which has a conventional 1.8 litre petrol turbo engine developing an unconventional 300 horsepower. And it comes in two forms, standard RS 300, priced at the time of this test from around £33,500, and Trophy, a track-ready, more focused, firmer sprung variant costing around £38,000. Both have to be had with paddle shift EDC auto transmission. Our focus here though is on the mainstream market and the way that the ordinary petrol and diesel Megans along with this E-Tech hybrid fit into that. So let's start with two market segment leaders, Ford's Focus and Volkswagen's Golf. Now in base form, uh, this Megane undercuts both those two rivals on price by a little in the case of the Focus and by nearly £2,000 in the case of the Golf. Plus, this Renault offers more equipment too, which compensates for the fact that a base Megane diesel is slightly pricier than the equivalent Eco Blue powered Focus. Again, the Golf in base TDI form is much more expensive, around £1,500 more in fact. This Megane though tends to appeal to customers who are prepared to look beyond those two market favourites. Maybe at cars in this sector like the Honda Civic, uh, the Mazda 3, the Mini Clubman, the Peugeot 308 and the Citroen C4 which all cost around the same. Uh, there might be possible interest in models like the Hyundai i30, uh, Seat's Leon or Skoda's Octavia which cost a bit less. Or in family hatches like the Vauxhall Astra and the Kia Seed, uh, equivalent versions of which will save you around £1,500 over this Renault. But in all these comparisons, the Renault's comparatively generous equipment tally may help to provide a rather more compelling showroom incentive. Um, even if you compare against a really cheap segment contender like Fiat's bargain basement Tipo, um, in the past we would also have referenced Toyota's Corolla, but that's now only offered as a full hybrid, so it costs significantly more. In terms of this E-Tech plug-in hybrid Megane variant, uh, the required £30,000 price point is pretty competitive. That's the kind of fee that's required for cars like the various Kia PHEV offerings, plug-in versions of the Nero, the Exceed and the Seed Sportswagon. And that figure undercuts by around £2,500 PHEV versions of the Seat Leon and the Skoda Octavia. You would spend more on a PHEV Peugeot 308 and a Volkswagen Golf GTE plug-in model is around £6,000 more. And that sells in the kind of premium £35,000 to £40,000 bracket which would get you a premium badged plug-in car uh, like a PHEV version of the Mercedes A-Class, the Audi A3 Sportback and the DS4. Finally, there's the Megane RS, which takes on similarly sized and powered hot hatches like the Honda Civic Type R, uh, the Volkswagen Golf GTI and the Cupra Leon. It undercuts models like the Audi S3, the Mercedes AMG A35 and the Golf R, but those cars all have four wheel drive and a bit more power. In short then, all variants of this Renault hatch face extremely tough competition, but even so, this Gallic contender might just catch your eye. And if it does, you'll want to know just how generous Renault has been when it comes to the standard kit. So let's see. All Megans are far better equipped these days. Even those with entry-level iconic spec now get full LED headlamps, signature C-shaped LED daytime running lights, power folding mirrors and all-round parking sensors. Inside, across the range, there's now a navigation system, dual zone climate control, virtual dials for the instrument cluster screen, that's at least seven inches in size, plus the multi-sense driving mode setup and cool ambient lighting with eight selectable colours. Also now standard fit is the Vizio system package of camera safety kit, get to that in a moment. Uh, disappointingly though, Renault still makes Megane customers pay more for key items like a space saver spare wheel and the e-call safety system that you'll find on most competitors these days, which is there to automatically alert the emergency services in the event of a crash. Specific items fitted with icon trimmed models include 16 inch diamond cut impulse alloy wheels as well as front fog lamps, tinted windows, a hands free key card and an alarm. Inside there are nice finishing touches like a rimless electrochromatic rear view mirror and black velvet style upholstery with front seat lumbar support. On petrol variants there's a useful fold flat front passenger seat for longer loads. Uh, infotainment is taken care of by a 7 inch landscape shaped central easy link navigation touchscreen uh, from which you can access not only the TomTom sat-nav, Bluetooth and Apple CarPlay, Android Auto smartphone integration but also a sound auditorium DAB audio setup. 
Ideally, though, you'd want to pay the extra for the plusher RS line trim level we're trying here, identifiable from the outside by bespoke bumpers and larger 17-inch RS line wheels. Inside, there's red-themed RS line trim, not only for the upholstery, but also for the dashboard, the doors, the gear stick and the steering wheel. And you get bigger screens too, a 10-inch one for the virtual instrument dials and a 9.3-inch portrait style centre stack easy link monitor for the infotainment functions. Uh, talking of screens, a rear parking camera is also standard at this level. This plusher trim level also includes sports seats with more pronounced side bolsters, but with those on petrol models, you lose the fold flat feature for the front passenger chair. The full fat RS shopping rocket model, only offered in hatch form, obviously has its own bespoke level of trim. And that includes the brand's RS vision lighting system and the multi-sense driving mode setup with uh, sport and race settings, which can be accessed by a shortcut RS button. Also standard is the four control four-wheel steering system, a special Perfo Hub independent steering axis front suspension system, and a Torsen limited slip differential. All these things combine to improve cornering. The standard RS300 variant, which features the softer sport chassis, gets 18-inch RS alloy wheels with 355mm front brake discs and Brembo calipers. The top trophy model, with its stiffer cup chassis, features 19-inch RS trophy alloy wheels with bimaterial brakes, plus that track-ready variant also includes an RS Napa perforated leather steering wheel and gear knob gaiter, uh, extra RS monitor telematics track features and heated seats with red-stitched Renault Sport Alcantara upholstery. But let's switch our focus back to the mainstream Megane models we're concentrating on for the purposes of this film. And let's talk about the available options. Heated front seats and a technology pack that you can add into the base iconic model. Uh, we'll add in the larger 9.3 inch center dash easy link infotainment screen plus a rear view camera. Otherwise, most of the really nice stuff is restricted to customers who've stretched up to this RS line level of trim. Uh, things like a premium nine speaker Bose audio system and heated front seats. Uh, they can be fitted out with black Alcantara RS line leather upholstery. Uh, the Megan RS trophy model can also be had with race style Recaro bucket seats. Beyond that, bear in mind you're almost certainly going to have to pay your Renault dealer more for your choice of paint colour. Uh, the only standard one is solid glacier white. There is a range of optional metallic shades and there are some more exclusive and pricier ID shades too, like this test car's iron blue. Uh, you will have to pay more to add back in the missing emergency spare wheel too. Otherwise, it's practical stuff like a swan neck or retractable tow bar, standard or an all-in-one boot liner, a boot sill protector, protective bodywork film, there's a pack for that, and mud flaps. Roof bars are available in the holiday pack, and that also includes a roof box, and in the bicycle rack pack. The Explore pack gives you a tow bar and a Eurobike tailgate carrier for two bikes, and an elegance pack uh, that will give you illuminated door sills and sports pedals. You can also add in a dash cam and an induction charger wireless phone charging mat. Enough with that, let's finish by talking about the safety features fitted across the range. Now this is an area in which recent history suggests this car will be very strong. At the turn of the century, Renault was the first mainstream brand to pioneer safety development with things like clever seat ergonomics, which led to innovations like anti-submarining technology that was able to stop occupants from sliding beneath their seat belts in head-on accidents. At first glance here, that trend seems to be continuing because this Megane was granted a full house five-star rating as part of the now tougher Euro NCAP safety test program. Wouldn't get that rating now though because almost unforgivably in the current market, mainstream icon trim models lack any kind of autonomous braking system. Renault's AEBS, the automatic emergency braking system, that's standard only on RS line trim models like this one. Renault, of course, would rather we concentrated on the camera safety stuff that all Megans do get, uh, now embellished on this facelifted model by the standard inclusion of the brand's Vizio pack, which gives you lane departure warning, traffic sign recognition, and automatic high-low beam headlights. 
as you'd expect there's all the usual passive safety stuff too so every Megane gets ABS anti-lock brakes and ESP stability control along with twin front side and curtain airbags although there's no driver's knee bag. Uh, other standard safety kit includes tyre pressure monitoring, ice fix child seat mounts on two outer back seats and hill start assist to help when you're pulling away on inclines. If you want to go further, then there's an optional safety pack that is disappointingly again limited to RS line trim and that further adds in the missing e-call setup plus adaptive cruise control and lane keeping assistance. Now that subtly steers the car back to where it ought to be if you drift across the lane separating lines. Adaptive cruise control and the e-call system also feature in the optional motorway pack that is limited to the conventionally engined Megans uh, and that adds a level of autonomous driving assistance with its traffic jam companion feature. Uh, now that uses lane centering and stop and go tech to virtually drive the car for you in urban motoring. Uh, that motorway pack also includes blind spot warning which alerts you if you're just about to pull out when there's a vehicle in your blind spot and also rear cross traffic alert and that warns you of oncoming vehicles when you're reversing out of a space. Across the range you can also get those last two features incorporated into the optional parking pack premium which additionally includes a hands-free parking system to steer you into spaces. can't help wondering whether the billions of euros that Renault's poured into electric vehicle development in the last decade has held back the development that we would otherwise have seen in the brand's conventional petrol and diesel engines. The fact that at the launch of this fourth generation Megane lineup, most of the core engine wear was carried over from the previous model certainly seems to suggest that. Still, in Renault's defence, there's a lot of life left in the TCU petrol and DCI diesel power plants being offered. Uh, they have been thoroughly refettled to meet the latest Euro 6 regulations, and they're not too far off the current class stand when it comes to running cost efficiency. Take the 1.5 litre DCI 115 diesel unit that the majority of Megane buyers will choose. At the original launch of this Mark IV Megane model, Renault promised that this unit would be offered with 48 volt hybrid assist mild hybrid tech, but there's still no sign of that. Uh, with the non-electrified version of this black pump fueled engine, official WLTP figures suggest that that Megane can manage 62.8 mpg on the combined cycle with both body styles and 117 grams per kilometer of CO2 in hatch form. It's 119 grams per kilometer for the Sport Tour estate. Perhaps not coincidentally, those readings are identical to those you get from a rival Volkswagen Golf 2 litre TDI 115 PS model, although equivalent base diesel versions of the Ford Focus and the Vauxhall Astra can do slightly better. It's also worth mentioning that there is only a fractional efficiency downside if you choose the EDC Auto gearbox as an alternative to the six-speed manual transmission. Uh, think 61.4 mpg and 121 grams per kilometre with hatch and 60.1 mpg and 122 grams per kilometre for the Sport Tourer. That is the sort of engineering feat that the Korean brands still haven't fully mastered. Now let's talk petrol power. This is the area of development in which Renault seems to have suffered most with its brand emphasis on all electric power. Uh, there simply hasn't been enough engineering resource and budget left over in the company to create the kind of downsized three-cylinder petrol power plant which now features in nearly all of this car's main rivals, uh, which is why a Megane 1.2-litre TCE 140 will cost you 10 to 15% more to run than, say, a comparable Focus 1-litre EcoBoost, a Golf 1-litre TSI, or a Peugeot 308 1.2-litre PureTech model. To be fair, all the models that we just mentioned are more expensive to buy than this one is, uh, the Golf and the Peugeot significantly so, and that means that if your likely ownership period is short and you won't be covering all that many miles, then this Renault could still work out as being a cheaper overall package. To be specific on those figures, a Megane 1.2 litre TCE 140 hatch manages 47.1 mpg on the combined cycle and 136 grams per kilometre of CO2. It's 44.8 and 142 grams per kilometre for the Sport Tourer estate. 
Again, there's very little penalty if you opt for the EDC automatic transmission. Think 46.3 mpg and 138 grams per kilometer for the hatch and 45.6 with 141 grams per kilometer for the Sport Tourer Estate. For completion, we'll also give you the stats for the Megane RS Hot Hatch, 33.6 uh, miles per gallon and 190 grams per kilometre for the RS300 and 33.2 mpg and 191 grams per kilometre for the RS Trophy variant. There is though a petrol powered Megane that stacks up rather better against its rivals and it is of course the E-Tech plug-in hybrid variant which we've been trying here. For this variant the WLTP figure for combined cycle fuel economy is up to 217.3 mpg, the WLTP CO2 reading is up to 30 grams per kilometre and as we said in our driving experience section the WLTP rated driving range is up to 30 miles. You'll need some class perspective on that. The Mini Countryman PHEV manages up to 156.9 mpg and up to 39 grams per kilometre and a driving range of up to 31.7 miles. And the three main Kia alternatives, the PHE versions of the Nero, the Seed Sports Wagon and the Exceed Crossover all manage up to 201.8 mpg, up to 31 grams per kilometre and a driving range of up to 36 miles. All those models, including this Renault, have CO2 figures that are green enough to qualify for a super low 10% benefit in kind taxation rating and free first year road tax. Of course, official figures are one thing, actual day-to-day -day returns are another. And mindful of this, Renault has provided a variety of e-driving tools to enable Megane E-Tech hybrid drivers to get as close as possible to the stated readings. Um, as you drive, you'll have to keep a close eye on the right-hand instrument screen dial, uh, keeping the needle as often as possible in the charge rather than in the power section. You'll also want to make frequent use of the provided pure and EV electric only driving modes and you'll also need to remember to often switch the auto gear lever to its B position so you can maximize regenerative brake energy harvesting and so preserve your battery charge. Regular activation of these tools, says Renault, will boost the urban all electric driving range of this car up towards 40 miles. Charging time via a Type 2 Mode 3 cable is 3 hours or 4 hours and 15 minutes from a domestic socket. If you get on top of all that, you'll want to keep an eye on how efficiently the powertrain is working and there are display options which enable you to do that on both of the provided TFT monitors. The right hand virtual dial in the instrument binnacle here has a central area that shows a triangulation of battery, e-motor and engine to depict in real time the hybrid system's flow of energy. But it's the central easy link screen that will be your main point of reference for your EV feedback. Consult the car info section and you'll find an energy info icon and that takes you to a history graph divided into 15, 10 and 5 minute sections plus a live graphic so you can see in real time what's happening. There's also a list screen that uh, gives you more useful EV readouts, one for average electric consumption and another for total recuperated energy. Right, that's enough on the PHEV model. Right across the Megane range, what else do you need to know about the economics of running this Renault hatch? Well, obviously, to get anywhere near to the quoted official efficiency figures, you'll have to do your part as a driver. And that means keeping as often as possible in the multi-sense eco driving mode, which slightly restricts the throttle travel and the climate control system output. Other stuff that you need to know includes the fact that Renault provides a four-year warranty, a little better than the three-year warranty provided by Ford, Peugeot and Vauxhall and the Volkswagen Group brands too, but nowhere near as good as a seven-year cover that Kia offers. Bear in mind that the final two years of that warranty uh, are restricted to 100,000 miles. This E-Tech Models PHEV systems battery has a separate eight-year, 100,000 mile warranty. Across the range, you get four years of UK emergency breakdown recovery and three years of European cover as part of the package. Insurance for the TCE 140 petrol model is Group 21 or 22. For the DCI 115 diesel variants, it's Group 18 or 19. For this E-Tech plug-in hybrid, it's Group 22. As for the Began RS Hot Hatch, it's Group 38 or 39. Across the lineup, scheduled servicing is every 12 months or 18,000 miles, whichever comes first. And as usual, prepaid servicing plans are available 
a three-year 30,000 mile deal or a 40,000 mile package. And finally, residual values. Uh, the experts at CAP reckon 31% after three years and 60,000 miles. Don't expect this McGann improved though it is to start shooting up the sales charts and challenging the class favourites. But we do think that youthful improvements built into this facelifted fourth generation model should secure its position in the Renault range going forward and prevent the kind of banishment from the UK market that has been meted out to so many of this brand's previously popular models over the last few years. This Megane model line's position today would doubtless be better if Renault hadn't ignored it quite so much in its turn-of-the-century drive towards electrification. So it's perhaps appropriate that this Gallic hatch's position has, with this facelifted range, been significantly improved by a dose of the electrification which that development drive has produced. Uh, we think this E-Tech plug-in hybrid is a genuinely underrated and very complete family car but it will be a rare sight on our roads as to a slightly lesser degree will more conventionally engined McGann hatches and Sport Tour estates. Those who do choose those variants will do so attracted by the smart styling, the plush and quite sophisticated cabin, the undemanding drive dynamics and the value orientated pricing. Now you can find those things in this segment elsewhere, but in many cases not quite so appealingly packaged. And in summary, well, it's true this may not be the European market leader it was a decade or so ago, but it's a compact family five-door that now ticks an awful lot of boxes, and one that an awful lot of people, we think, might rather enjoy owning.